As you look, being seated, look at three people and tell them, you're blessed and highly favored of God. You are blessed, 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 and highly favored of God. Hallelujah. What an awesome presence of God. We'll turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 4. 1 Samuel chapter 4, my subject this morning, you can't fetch God. You can't fetch God. America is in a crisis. We have forgotten the time-honored values that made this nation great. And the church must unite in prayer for the survival of the nation of America. The last presidential election, it was not an election between two men. It was an election between honoring the word of God and open rebellion to the teachings of this holy book that I hold in my hand. God blesses those who obey his word, and he brings judgment to those who do not obey his word. And the church holds the keys for the future of America. And prayer moves the hand of God. That's why I'm announcing another week of prayer. We're not going to go under. We're going over. Hallelujah. And we're not going to allow the devil to take our nation. We're taking this nation back to God. We have the keys, but we have to pray. But we have to do more than pray. We have to engage the culture. And we must take biblical biblical convictions into the voting booth and we must vote for leaders that best represent biblical standards and today i want us to take a lesson from ancient israel they were backslidden just like america is today first samuel 4 and 1 and the word of the lord came to all israel now israel went out against the philistines to battle and pitch in ebenezer and the philistines pitched at aphex and the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel, and when they joined the battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. Verse 3 says, And when the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore has the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Now I want you to listen to these words right here. Let us fetch. Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of shallow unto us, that when it cometh in among us, it may save us out of the hands of the enemy. Let us fetch God. That ark represented the presence of God. Verse 4 says, So the people sent to shallow that they may bring forth from thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the seraphims. And two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, they were there with the ark of the covenant of God. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so did the earth ring again. Verse 6 says, And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth this noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was come into the camp. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe unto us! There has not been such a thing hitherfore. Woe unto us! Who shall deliver us out of the hands of these mighty gods? Verse 10. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten. And they fled every man into his tent, and there was a great slaughter, for there fell of the Israel 30,000 footmen. And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons, Eli and Phinehas, they were slain. You know the rest of the story. Eli would not correct his sons. He was a backslidden priest. When he heard the news that the Ark of the Covenant had been taken, he was sitting on a pedestal and he fell backwards. He was a fat man and he broke his neck. And when Phinehas' wife, she was pregnant, heard that the Ark of the Covenant had been taken, she gave birth to that child. She said, call his name Ichabod. Ichabod, which means the glory of the Lord has departed my subject this morning you can't fetch god let us pray father thank you for this great nation thank you for the church jesus you said i'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it so we know that the church is triumphant the church is victorious 
But the church must rise up and the church must engage the culture with the truth of the word of God. So, Lord, I pray this morning that you will empower us, that the Holy Ghost will overshadow each and every one of us, that he will give us a spirit that will not back down, that will not give in, but that will declare, thus saith the Lord, and that we will rise up as the church triumphant of the Lord Jesus Christ and take this nation back to God. And the church said in Jesus' name, amen. I want you to see this picture. Israel is in a battle, and now they need God's presence. So they head to Shiloh, the place where they left God's presence. They are going there to fetch God because now they are in a battle. They didn't need him when everything was going okay. They didn't need him when everything was going good. But now they are in a crisis. And so they decide we will go and fetch God. And they run down to Shiloh and they bring the Ark of the Covenant back to the battlefield. And now they think, praise God, hallelujah. We've got God, and we're going to win the battle. Now, we're real spiritual. We're in a crisis, but we're crisis Christians, and we'll stay on fire just as long as we're in a crisis. But as soon as the crisis lives, we'll just put God back in his box. That's the way a lot of people live their lives. That's the way a lot of people treat God. They are crisis Christians. They make no effort to come to church. And they put other things before God. The church is in a backslidden condition. We are one of the few churches that has a Sunday night service. And we, we try to observe holidays and things, but there's no need for me to stand up and preach a message like this if I'm not going to do what I'm preaching. If I will not call this prayer, this church to prayer, there's no need for me to say you need to pray. If I will not take my time and spend my energy in calling and encouraging people to pray for this nation, then I'm like a dumb dog that will not bark out, that will not cry out to God. But I'm going to cry out to God because I know God answers prayer. Haven't you enjoyed the rain here lately? Amen. <laughs> Go on, praise God. Hallelujah. Let me ask you, if you were to find yourself in a crisis right now, what would you change about your life? If you found an x-ray and it had a spot on it, what would you change about your life? You don't need to wait until you get into a crisis. You need to make a change right now. Today is the day of salvation. There are a lot of people who make no special effort to come to church, and they put ever, other things before God. And when you spend less time with Jesus and more time with friends and personal things, you are headed for a crisis. I want you to see what happened to Israel in their crisis. They fetched the Ark of the Covenant. And the very next day, they went out to the battlefield. And I can hear them saying, praise God, now we've got God. We've got him and we're going to win. The first day without God, they lost 4,000 men. The second day, they went out with the Ark of the Covenant and God's presence with them, and 30,000 people died. Why? Why did so many die when they had God's presence with them? It was because they thought they could fetch God. Let us go fetch God. We want to use him because we're in a crisis. Please understand this. God will use you, but you will never use God. You can worship God. You can serve God. You can love God, but you cannot use God. And I'm afraid that we're living in a generation that thinks they can fetch God whenever they need him and they can just put him back in the box after the crisis is over. And they really don't want an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. They don't want his lordship. They don't want him messing with their personal lives. They don't want him dealing with issues in their lives that are not right. They don't want him to put any demands on the time frame in their life. They just want to be able, when the battle comes, to run down to the church, fetch God real quick, and bring him to the battlefield so they can win. And they think, as soon as I get out of this, God can go back to where God came from, and I'll just go right back to what I was doing. That's what ancient Israel did. And that, my friend, is a picture of what America is doing today. Now, here's the problem. God was their last resort 
and not their first choice. God is a jealous God. He said, you shall have no other gods before me. That means you can't fetch God just because you're in a crisis. God will not be your last reward, last resort, rather. He will save you. He will work with you until you get it all together. But once you come to the knowledge of God and you get more and more of his word inside of you, there will come a point where God will say, I'm getting tired of you running down to fetch me just because you're in a crisis. You can't fetch God. Now, I came to God in a crisis. So there's nothing wrong with coming to God when there's a crisis. But when you come to God, come under the lordship of Jesus Christ. He doesn't want to be a sometimes Jesus. He wants to be an everyday Jesus. He wants to walk with you, to talk with you. He wants you to talk with him, to love him, to commune with him. But I want to tell you, once you come to the knowledge of truth, you cannot just go fetch God because you're in a crisis. You can't just run down when you're about in a battle and say, I have decided now I will become a serious Christian. That's why you ought to really honor God in prosperity and in health and in the good times. Now, there are two times when we as Christians, we are really vulnerable. When you have nothing, and secondly, when you have everything. And in those two extremes, you ought to show God that your worship is just as passionate when you've got it all as when you have nothing but his promise. I can worship him. Hallelujah. I've said it many times. I can worship him in a hat full of devils. And I throw the hat on the floor just to dance and worship him. God can be touched. God is touched with the feeling of your infirmity. But God doesn't want you using him. God wants you to worship him and to love him. See, God's people have always had a problem of drifting, backsliding, and neglecting God when the blessings are flowing. But it doesn't have to be that way. God has spoken to Israel earlier, and he told him, don't forget me at the place of the fullness of blessings. Don't let your heart be lifted up. Don't forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the house of bondage. See, America's in a crisis right now, and we have forgotten God at the place of fullness and blessings. No other nation has ever enjoyed the riches, the wealth, and the prosperity that America enjoys. Yet we have allowed this nation to decay morally. And we have sat back in silence, the church that is, not standing up for Christian beliefs. Our nation has forgotten God. and We have allowed other world religions to gain a stronghold in America. And now instead of serving the true and the living God, our nation endorses multipluralism and the worship of pagan gods. The greatest temptation that God's people will ever face, it is not lust, it is not wickedness, it is not the sins of the flesh. But if you're not careful, your spiritual senses will be dulled by prosperity, fullness, and blessings. And that, my friend, is what has happened to America. And if you aren't careful, you will come so wrapped up in the things of the world that you will forget God. And then when you need God, guess what? Just like Israel couldn't fetch God, you can't fetch God. I'm afraid that America's just like Israel, that we have fallen into this trap. The church has been silent far too long. The church has refused to address cultural issues that may offend people. And as a result, we have become a nation of misfits, lawbreakers, and we're rotting at the core. Our lawmakers have become lawbreakers. Jesus said that it's impossible for men not to be offended when the truth of the word of God is spoken. Jesus said it's impossible. You cannot preach this word, teach this word, or tell anybody about this word without them being offended. Did you ever wonder what brings persecution? Well, I prayed and I asked the Lord, and this is what he gave me. Persecution comes when men speak the truth, and others hate and despise you for preaching the truth. 
Do you think that the leadership of this nation loves God, the God that we serve? They hate God. They hate the name of Jesus. They despise the church, and they're doing everything they can to wipe the church out. People say, well, the preacher shouldn't get mixed up in politics. Well, how can I be called to a prophetic ministry if I do not speak the truth into every situation of life? If I am called to preach this word, I have to take this prophetic word, and I have to speak it into every situation of life. And that means I've got to address things in the church that are not right. That means that if we have people sitting in the church that don't hold to biblical principles and parties that don't hold biblical principles, I say this is what the, the book says. This is a prophetic church right here. This is a church that believes the word of God, and we're not going to back down. So how could I not speak the word of God into every situation of life if I'm involved in the prophetic ministry? This book is about the end time. This book is about how to live your life. This book tells us what to do in every situation that we face in life. Now, I prayed a lot over this thing, but I want you to look at this admonition and this warning from the Word of God. 1 Peter 4, 14. The Word says, If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. Look at that. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you on their part. His evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Well, the matter is we're to take the gospel to the whole world, and we're not just to go into the other world. We're to take it into America. So we're not busybodies. We're busy about the Father's business. Amen. We should not allow the murder and the killing of little innocent babies when the church has the power to engage the culture and to establish biblical standards. 1 Peter 4, 16, it continues. For if any man that suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God on his behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God and at first begin at us. What shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of, of God? Look at this. If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the son appear? See, it is impossible to address cultural issues and not to offend evil people that oppose biblical standards. And some of them are in the church. Oh, they, they shout and they sing. But they go to the voting booth and they vote for people that have values that are totally contrary to biblical standards. And the church must have a voice. And I'm part of that voice that God is raising up to speak to this nation and to get the people to pray. Just look at the protests that have resulted from the reversal of Roe versus Wade, which allowed abortion as a constitutional right. Right now, America has a period of grace before judgment comes. And in this period of grace, we must all make our calling and our election sure. Because judgment will begin at the house of the Lord. And this is a prophetic word right from the word of God. I'm not standing here prophesying God's going to do this and God's going to do that. I'm just prophesying this is what the word of God says. And I have a prophetic word. Hallelujah. When God looks at his church and decides enough is enough, judgment will come. And you cannot fetch God when judgment comes. Israel could not do it, and neither will the church be able to do that. You can't fetch God when his presence departs. Jesus spoke to his church and said, you're not either cold nor hot, but you're lukewarm. What is wrong with the church? COVID is over. Let's get back in the house of God. Let's have Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, prayer night. Let's get us some leaders, praise God, with some spine that will place a demand on the preachers in the pulpit and say, you will open your church and you will lead your people in worship. If you're a shepherd under the good shepherd, Jesus cared for his sheep and you'll care for yours or I'll remove you from the pulpit. We need some leadership like that that has a strong voice. 
Can I get one amen out of that? <laughs> Hallelujah. Look at what Jesus said in Revelation 3.15. He said, I know thy works. Thou neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then because you're lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. He said, you make me sick. Do you want God to look at your life and to look at this church and say, Westmoreland, you have made me sick. And I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. I don't, I, I don't want to be a part of a church. I want to be a part of a church that has a passion, that, that, that has a fire burning for the harvest of souls, that has a fire burning to live right, that has a fire inside of them. Says, I'll go to church. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I'm, I'm not going to be a sometimes Christian. When the doors open, I'm going if I can get there. And if I'm out of town, I'm going there somewhere, hallelujah. I'm going where the presence of God is. I'm not going to wait to fetch God. I'm going to take him with me everywhere I go, hallelujah. And when I need him, when I step into the battle, glory to God, I know I'm going to be victorious because whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. No weapon formed against you shall ever prosper. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a stand against him because we're more than conquerors through him that loved us and gave himself for us. Go on and praise him. Hallelujah. We are carriers. We carry God's presence wherever we go. Woo! Ha ha! I think I'll take a praise break. Hallelujah. Then preach myself happy. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can't fetch God. Verse 17, Revelation 3, 17. Because thou says, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knoweth not thou wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Then Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door, the door of my church, and knock. Any man that hears my voice, let him hear. What the Spirit said. I'm standing at the door and knock. If you hear my voice, if you'll open the door, I will come into you. I'll save you. I'll fellowship with you. I'll be your God. And you'll be my people. And when the hard times come, I will be there. I'll take you through the fire, through the flood, and through the water. None of it shall overcome you. And I've prepared a place for you at the end of the journey. And if you'll walk with me and talk with me, you can make it. Go and praise God. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. Hallelujah. See, we're in the last days, and the church in general is asleep. COVID is over. We're in the last days, and it's time for the church to arise and shine and let God's glory arise throughout the community. You can't fetch God. When judgment comes. Shortly after 9-11, the churches of America were filled. That was for about three weeks. And after that, people went right back to their old ways. I'm afraid that as Americans, we want to do all the wickedness we choose. And when we get in trouble, we want to run down and fetch God. We want to fetch him and we want to win him to win our battles. And we cry, oh, God, get us out of this mess. And just as soon as the crisis is over, we go right back to the same old stuff. See, the abortions haven't stopped just because Roe versus Wade was reversed as a constitutional right. It has now become a state issue. They have not stopped. And our elected officials, they are lobbying right now to reverse this decision. Can you believe the people of America that protested in front of the judges' houses demanding that they reverse their decision and threatening their lives and our elected officials did nothing to these lawbreakers? That's the kind of nation you're in right now. The ungodliness hasn't stopped. The wickedness hasn't stopped. The pornography hasn't stopped. The trafficking of human lives through our open borders has not stopped. The drug traffic that's coming into America, fentanyl is killing thousands of people, young people in America. None of it has stopped. And as a nation, 
after 9-11, guess what? America has gotten worse. We have shake, shaken our fist in God's face. We have political leaders who need to be voted out, and the church must lead the way. Take your biblical standards into the voting booth and vote that ungodly crowd out. Your future's on fire. I preached a whole sermon on your future's on fire. And God just keeps bringing me back to this because I'm not just to sit here and watch my nation rot at the core. You and I have the keys of the kingdom. We have God's word. We are commissioned to go into all the world, and that includes going into the church and going into America, going out on the streets and speaking this word of God to people and making a difference and addressing the culture. Amen. These elected officials we have, they openly speak out against righteousness and godly principles. And, and they say, we don't want you to mention the name of Jesus. And we don't want you praying in that name in our assemblies. We, do, we want same-sex marriage. We don't care what you say or what the Bible says about it. We want to abort little babies. We are pro-choice and not pro-life. And we don't want any unwanted babies to change our lifestyle. We don't want prayer in our schools. That's what they say. We don't want the Ten Commandments or the Bibles in our school. We want free lunches to help those that are hungry in our school district, but we don't want the name of God mentioned because it may be offensive to some parent. My Lord, you're going to be persecuted for speaking righteousness. When you speak out to someone and, and give them biblical standards, they are not going to like you. The early church was persecuted, and this church age that we're in we will be persecuted for righteousness' sake, but we can take this nation back to God. This nation is a gift from God, and I am going to do my part. That blood was shed to give us this great salvation we have in Jesus Christ, and blood was shed to give us this great nation. It came out of the heart of God. It was planted by the hand of God. So what are we going to do with the gift that God has given to us? God bless America from sea to shining sea with an outpouring of his spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. God help us. See, church, we must repent. We have sinned as a nation, and we'd better learn that we cannot just fetch God when we get in trouble. We're in trouble as a nation. The church is asleep. And I don't think this has gripped our hearts the way it should. I say, God, why do you trouble me with this so much? I'm a happy camper. I, I'd rather preach on the goodness of God. I, I'd rather preach on uh, the righteousness of God and who we are in Christ. Yet God just keeps coming back to me over and over again and drilling this message into my heart. So I'm just preaching to you out of my overflow. We like the frog. You could place him in a pot of boiling water and he'd just leap out. But if you put that same frog in a pot and turn the water up slowly, he'll just sit there until you boil him to death. See, the changes in America, they have come slowly. But the changes have come. And as a nation, we're in hot water. We're in hot water, and you just cannot fetch God when you need him. Now, think about the first day that Israel went out to battle. They lost 4,000 men without the presence of God. The second day they went out with the presence of God and they lost 30,000 men. The Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant that represented God's presence. And they thought they had captured God and they had God in a box, but God can't be captured and God can't be put in a box either. He'll jump out of my box and your box. He's God. He can do anything he wants to, anytime he wants to. He doesn't have to ask anybody's permission. He's God Almighty. He created everything. He has no need of anything. He just wants the people to worship him. He loves you. He loves me. He sent his son to shed his blood on Calvary's cross so he could redeem us from the curse of the law and we could make heaven our eternal home. All of that came because of the goodness of God. And this nation came out of the heart 
child of God because of the goodness of God and America has blessed more nations than any other nation in the history of mankind. Go on, praise God that you live in America. Hallelujah. They took the Ark of the Covenant of the temple into the temple of Dagon, and Dagon was their false god. He was half fish and half man. And they set the Ark of the Covenant beside Dagon, and they left, and they came back the next day. And Dagon had fallen over on his face, and his hands and his head were cut off. And the Philistines, they get themselves a lift, and they try to pick their God back up and put him back together. I don't need a God that I've got to pick up. I need a God that can pick me up. I don't need a God that I've got to carry. I need a God that can carry me. I, I don't need a God that I have to put back together. I need a God that can put me back together. Hallelujah. The Philistines thought they could control God. They thought they had God in a box. But God cannot be controlled. And you cannot fetch God. That's why we must learn to live close to Jesus. Don't wait until a crisis comes in your life to get spiritual. Walk with the Lord each and every day. Walk with him. Talk with him. And keep an open line of communication with your Savior. You may not need him today in a crisis situation. You may not be in a crisis situation tomorrow. But the time will come when you will need God. He came into my life, and I know what I'm talking about. And a preacher that doesn't have a testimony, he doesn't have a whole lot to say anyway. I was broken and fragmented. My heart was broken. My life was broken. My dreams were broken. But Jesus and God the Father, who is rich in mercy, he came and got me. He said, I'm coming through your walls. I'm coming after you. I couldn't get out. I was locked behind walls. A lot of people under the sound of my voice, they're behind walls. And you can't get out. Others can't get in. You put a wall. But the problem is, you can't get out. But I can tell you this. Jesus came through my walls. He said, I'm coming to get you, boy. And he picked me up. And he carried me out. I couldn't get out. But he picked me up. <laughs> And he carried me out. He took my feet out of the miry clay and put my feet on the rock to stay. Woo! Hallelujah. And goodness and mercy, they, they follow me everywhere I go. Oh, I've had hard times, but I know he's with me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and here's the good part. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hallelujah. Go on and praise him. If God be for us, who can be against us? Hallelujah. I close with this. We as a nation, we have a short period of grace. And now's the time for the church in America to cry out to God in true repentance. Lord, we have sinned. Lord, our nation is in trouble. Lord, help us. Send us a supernatural spiritual awakening. So you can't fetch God just because you're in a mess, in a mess. But we have a short period of grace. Jesus is coming. And he says, Second Chronicles 7, 14, he said, If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, 
turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. Never forget this, right out of the prophetic word of God, judgment shall begin at the house of the Lord. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinners appear? That's why the Lord moved on my heart to put this cross here so you could write the names of your loved ones. The harvest is white. The labors are few. I want you to come to this altar and I want us to pray that the Lord of the harvest will send laborers into his field and that the church, let us come, let us come and pray, talk to God because you can't fetch God. He's given us a period of grace. And he said, today, if you hear my voice, hearken unto what I'm saying. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Help us, Lord. Every hour. Nations are made up of people, Lord. I need thee. There's a war going on in the heavens, Lord. Me now, We're not wrestling flesh and blood. I the spirit of wickedness has come out strong in America against the spirit of God. Just like those Philistines came out against Israel. Lord, we're in a great battle. And you spoke to me and said, I've given the church a period of grace. I want you to assemble my people to pray. So, Lord, we cry out, have mercy upon us. Forgive us of our sins in this nation, oh God. Forgive us for killing little innocent babies. Thank you, Father, for moving in great power and reversing Roe versus Wade. But, Lord, it's not over. I know it's not over, and the people know it's not over. We've got to cry out to our Father, which art in heaven. We've got to pray that you will send us a spiritual tsunami into America, that you will touch the hearts of those, Lord, in that Oval Office and in that Congress, Touch the hearts of those in the house, Lord, our governmental officials. Thank you for giving us judges that would properly interpret our constitutional rights. And interpret them properly, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, our founding fathers, they had your wisdom and your knowledge. They were governmental officials clergymen, many of them. Lord, give us officials that have your heart, that care for America. Oh God, be merciful. Be merciful. Be merciful to us, oh Lord. Oh, Lord, we, need we need you. The old, we need you, Master. crisis but our nation is and Lord I pray to come in great power and great glory Lord touch your church touch the pastors make them watchmen Lord that, that they'll read Isaiah 56 and they'll say I'm a watchman I'm to cry out against the evil I'm to cry out and I'm to lead the people according to God's prophetic word. And I'm to pray and seek God for direction. Hallelujah. Oh, now bless, bless me. 
bless us, Lord, in this nation. My Savior, I come. We come to you. 